for our first panel, which is called Powering the Future, Unlocking Public-Private Resources for Micromobility Startups. So um, if I could have you all start to walk up, I will say your names as you're walking up. Um, we've got uh, Janine Ward, who is the Program Manager for the Office of Future Mobility and Electrification at the State of Michigan. Let's go ahead and give her a round of applause. We've got Frederick Canal, who's the Impact Ventures Director at EIT Urban Mobility. So let's give him a round of applause. And then right next to me, we have Sean Flood, who's the founder at Today and a managing member of EFO Venture. So let's go ahead and sit and we'll get this party started. Okay. So uh, first question is one that I want all of you to answer. And it's a reverse elevator pitch. So we're talking today about unlocking public and private resources. All of you are investors or have been investors, uh, both on the public and then on the private side. So um, if I could start with you, Frederick, first, I'd love for you to give me just what's the elevator pitch of why startups should choose you as their investor? Well, I think startups, by getting investment from us, it can open up the whole of the market through partnerships and uh, and pilot opportunities, test opportunities with cities, for example. That was, I think, under 60 seconds. So, Frederick, for that alone, you get, like, my, I, if I start a startup in Europe, I'm going to come to you. Janine, why don't you go next? Yeah, so in the state of Michigan, although we're obviously representing Michigan, we're not exclusive to Michigan-based companies. So we'll help you unlock all of the potential that, that you have within our state, uh, both on the manufacturing side, partnerships, um, but also federal resources as well. Uh, we'll support you in pursuing those opportunities. So we're kind of that one-stop shop to connect you between our different state, of, state departments, the Office of the Governor, as well as policy and programming support throughout our state. So I'm hearing a theme already in the elevator pitch, which is both of you are offering connections and especially connections to either EU policymakers or to the state of Michigan, which in a U.S. context is is quite powerful. Right. Um, awesome. Sean, why don't you put on your investor hat? Yeah. Helmet. Your investor helmet. Helm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, EFOV is a relatively small uh, fund, but we only focus on the mobility space. And I think the the differentiator is that we're not traditional investors. We're operators. So I was a founder and CEO for 14 years. I'm a co-founder of today, but we are all about the operation side of the business. So I think if we were kind of selling ourselves, it would be that we sat in the same chair, we're sitting in the same chair today and uh, like getting from A to B for a startup is very important. And I'd say we're, we're firefighters, right? We're not looking at like 10 year strategy plans. We're like, what the hell do you do for the next 30 days? Hmm. And that's probably our secret sauce. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. I haven't heard an investment firm describe themselves as firefighters before. Usually it's like the five-year, 10-year outlook. And then certainly from the public side of things, what are you all looking at normally? Like five years, 10 years, or is it more one year, two years? It depends on the day. It yep. depends on the day. I think it depends on we're, the day. we're looking at uh, current projects. We're traditionally looking at like six to six months to a year out. Sure. Um, but as we're working on that project, we're also in tandem working on a playbook to make that make sure that that project, that idea is feasible long-term, repeatable, um, so that we can provide resources in the future for other organizations who are interested in doing something similar and yeah. with each other's failures and successes. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And if I might say a moment on this firefighting question before really diving into the three topics I want to cover today, um, how does that change your thesis for investment? If you're firefighting and you're looking at the next 30 days, like that has to be a little bit of a different thesis than it would be if you have a longer outlook. Yeah, I think it's probably the nature of myself and my partner, just our approach to industry and our returns. And we want to surround ourselves around entrepreneurs who are in the fight. Mm -hmm. So there are significantly better, bigger, more strategic investors out there. But we look for companies that we really love, operators that we can help, and that there's going to be an impact. We still like to make money, but I think all of them. Go for the scrappy underdog. I get it. I get it. It's a bit of like a film, you know, uh, un unraveling. Interesting. And then, Frederick, for you, your timeline of, inv of investment is a little bit longer, right? So how does that well, affect your change? Yeah, yeah. There are some startups that actually, uh, I, you can see them breaking even with it. Yep. Uh, but some of them were in infrastructure, for example. You need to get 10 cycles. So yeah. Like yeah. And as you're investing in companies too, do you have a clear vision of what you want micromobility to look like in the future? And is that like European in nature? Well, yes. Yeah. Obviously, yes. I think. And I don't. I don't mean to classify all Europe as the same, but yeah. 
Yeah. So for example, I think that, um, I guess that one of the things that we're looking for as an investor is first of all, where we can see gaps in the traditional VC, the private kind of funding, like, uh, water mobility, uh, autonomous ferries, these kind of things, but also apps to nudge, change people's behavior. So looking at how it affects our investment thesis, I think that we look at, I think mainly three things. Uh, I think that impact is super important. So we judge and we evaluate the impact created by the startup. Uh, and then oh, second criteria is usually uh, how many female co-founders they have. Oh, really? Yeah. Great. And the last one is obviously, uh, is there a gap? So we're not going to invest in another uh, scooter operator, or Chinese manufacturer or scooters and something like that. We look for the gaps where obviously... Uh, VCs have really adopted these kind of business models. Yeah. Great. Okay. So uh, let's get into it. There are three thoughts. The first is <laughs> public uh, versus private investment and uh, just a discussion around which should come first. Uh, the second is around levels of investment. Are we investing in us? And then the third is around areas for investment. So how can we grow the micromobility landscape? And I want to start out with the public versus private investment question. Um, so I mentioned my day job is uh, more in climate tech. It's more in like the broader climate space. And in the U.S., we've had the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that have just unleashed billions. And I, I think we're in trillions at this point, a trillion, you know, like in that order uh, of magnitude of public investment for different climate tech um, uh, 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 infrastructure facilities, vehicles, et cetera. But micromobility is like a very small proportion of that. Um, and at the same time, we're seeing lots of investment on um, the private side for climate tech. But again, micromobility is just like a small fraction of it. It might be uh, on the order of like 8%. So um, Janine, I'm hoping you can give me your thoughts first on how um, on public investment in micromobility right now and specifically like just start with the foundational. Should the public sector invest in micromobility, and uh, and when? Absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was kind of a micro Yeah. And uh, I mean, honestly, even even just prepping to come here, I've, I've looked back at everyone we've ever invested in, and there is a small percentage that is micromobility focused. And we need to change that. And we need to fix that. We've we've supported bike share programs. We should uh, support some infrastructure for charging for micromobility options. Commute is somewhere at this building, a, a Michigan-based company, and they're fantastic. And there's a handful of others as well. Um, but we definitely need to increase those numbers, especially coming from Michigan. Uh, when you hear Michigan, you hear Detroit, you hear auto. And we really need to dispel that that's all we care about. Uh, so as much as we can, we're, we're trying to really diversify what we focus on. So we've had uh, grants focused on um, uh, maritime uh, mobility. We've had aerial mobility grants. We haven't had a micro mobility. Mm. And that's something that we're working on that right now, Janine. The yeah. Thing we're yeah. On right Are we going to all collectively hold Janine to having a micro mobility grant? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a lot of that, but. <laughs> Janine, we know some people in the state of Michigan, too. We can help. <laughs> so something we want to focus on. And then we also want to bring together kind of an industry advisory group. So we have our Council on Future Mobility and Electrification, and that's a government uh, governor-appointed council. And it's very auto-heavy. Um, and automotive, for better or worse, does run a bit of our state. Um, so how do we change that and how do we get more engagement from, from more diverse areas of the mobility space? Um, so we're bringing together kind of an industry advisory focused specifically on micromobility. So if you're interested in joining or being part of that group, email me after this or hit me up on Brella. Great. Um, so that we can be more strategic and more focused on this area. Interesting. And uh, Janine, do you have a perspective on when you think the private or sorry, the public sector should invest? So do you think private dollars should come in first and then public? Do you? You know, what's what's your prediction? There's at least some amount of private dollars going in first and then moving over to public when with the companies that we're, we're working on. We don't necessarily have a preference on either. We're, we're always open to any good idea and anything that's. Yeah. And interesting. And you mentioned that you haven't had a micromobility grant, but that your office has invested in some micromobility companies. So 
space with more open rounds of funding. So okay. we've got some some great programs that are a little bit more open to anyone, real world deployments, anything impacting a community, um, open call for projects. Okay. Uh, but there's not many that are submitted in the micro mobility space. And when there's a current one, we do support it. Um, but we need to increase the amount that that are coming and reaching out and contact us. Yeah, interesting. So Sean, we want to come to you next just to talk about private levels of investment of uh, in micro mobility right now. Um, what are your thoughts about the role of private investment as micro mobility currently stands? Yeah, so so I think both are very important. Yeah, uh, and I actually a lot of times think that pri- that public money should come in first because it helps to de-risk and and it should be how government utilizes funds to to help grow uh, new new businesses and de-risk it for the the regular markets. Um, but I think we have to look at mobility with a different lens. I think. We're all in a bit of an echo chamber, right? It's, it's an echo chamber I like to be in because you're all my people. But we're all used to talking about mobility and micromobility. Uh, when we leave these walls, nobody has a real sense of how big it is and how long it's been around. My mom is 81 and she still has no idea what I do for a living, right? Like she'll see a scooter on the road. She's like, is that you? And like, <laughs> so we've got a, a marketing kind of problem that we have to educate the rest of the world. So we look at micromobility 1.0, the billions of dollars that were invested in VCs. To your point earlier, some companies worked, others didn't. There's going to be consolidation. Micromobility 2.0, where we're living right now, that's a whole nother round of investing. We've de-risked a lot of business models. It typically drives innovation. There's new startups who got the ability to look at what happened over the past three or four years and now build new innovative companies, technologies around it. So I think round two of private dollars it's now smarter money right mm-hmm. we all know what didn't work mm-hmm. and then you get all of these public monies that could then layer on top of that so to me it's a wildly exciting time to that's invest. crazy here i love the optimism and i i want to talk about private investors for a second because i think what you found in micromobility 1.0 is that what we're calling it micromobility 1.0 yeah. is that about a lot of <laughs> patented by you, yes, um, is that uh, there were a lot of general VCs that came in or generalist VCs that came in. And now when you talk about smarter money coming in, what do you mean by that? Do you think it's going to be a different set of VCs? Do you think it's going to be growth? Yeah, I, I think, look, this isn't throwing shade at them, um, but the the investment thesis was underwriting what is really a hardware business under the same thesis is that they built platforms on. They thought that they were going to invest like this was a software industry. There's great software that ties to them. At the end of the day, like let's just call a spade a spade. We are a hardware industry that has great technology around it. Yeah. And that investment thesis drove insane valuations around a company that didn't have the bones of that business. Still valuable, could generate real revenue, but the thesis was wrong. I think... V2, the thesis should be right because we we get hindsight. Hmm. Yeah, always the benefit of hindsight. And this is interesting that um, in your sort of definition of it, V2 is still about hardware with software around it. I do think that moving into V3, if we can talk about that as well at some point, is going to be more software centric. Um, So anyways, we'll see. But Frederick, I actually want to get you to come in on this um, in terms of public uh, and private levels of investment in the, in Europe and how you see that it might differ from what's happening in the U.S. or even just like your characterization of it. I think uh, one of the learnings that we have, I think we made, we make 50 investments per year about and uh, half of them are micromobility investments. And one of the main differentiators between, I think, the mobility industry compared to traditional VC industries is that Typically, a startup would start locally in a city or something and then take one city at a time. Mm. So I think the whole model of VC investing where you're looking for uh, non-exponential or exponential growth, non-linear growth, uh, and uh, building a portfolio uh, with a certain level of risk and everything is different in our industry. And what that means is that first of all, I mean, if, if I look at the, the amounts that startups typically are looking for for us, it's between 50K and 200K, maybe a euro or so, dollars, same, as a first investment. Usually they have an angel or a small VC fund as a co-investor at that stage. But they don't grow in the same way. So I think many of the, probably the Silicon Valley VCs are going to have a very hard time investing in this sector. 
Sure. Interesting. Or uh, maybe that all micromobility doesn't grow in the same way. There's some parts of the you know innovation that are going to be more linear, and there's some that you're going to see the hockey stick. Um, and I'll, I'll just point to a, a piece of research that RMI did recently on um, how electric cars and trucks uh, sales have gone up over time. And uh, what's happening, and we see this also with two-wheelers and three-wheelers, especially in Asia, is that you have this hockey stick adoption. And so we're actually going to blow out of the water what our projections were for the percentage of sales um, of electric vehicles in places like China or um, reach, you know, milestones three years earlier than we expected. And so, you know, the, the point of all this being like, I think we're going to see some hockey so stick adoption and then some things that are more linear. Um, so I want to move on to the second topic of are we investing enough? I mean, I know what the answer is going to be. So it's not really, we're not really going to go across and say, like, are we investing enough, Sean, you first. But Sean, um, curious, uh, you're viewing this from the standpoint of both an entrepreneur and an investor. How do you, well, how does your answer change about whether we're investing enough in micromobility? Because you see it for both sides. Yeah. So, yeah, it's easy to say we're not investing enough. I think we're not investing correctly. Mm. I think the amount is relative, relative to the need and, and where you are. So I think my hope, so our new business today is a hardware and mobility as a service business combined, actually headquartered in Ireland. So we get the benefit of understanding what the European uh, network is doing from a, a public and private standpoint. So I think that it's got to be more money with a different thesis and then looking at this as a long-term sector. I think historically, there's there's plenty of people, hopefully they're not in this room, that are like, that was a fad. Like, that was a moment in time, and we're all going to go back and drive gas-powered F-150s. If you feel that way, like, it's kind of the first question I ask an investor. If we're off on that, we shouldn't turn the page to the next conversation. If you like that idea, well, then let's talk about what business looks like, what investment looks like, what returns look like for what I just described. I think that's the next level of investment. Interesting. And in your mind, is there like a golden number of how much money should be pumped into micromobility right now? Uh, at least what we're investing in cars. Yeah, right. Globally. Yeah. So the, not, not just in the businesses, but the infrastructure, like all the dollars that come out of our taxes in the U.S. and in Europe to fix roads, to have four wheel, wheel gas and sure and have electric cars on it, that number plus a dollar. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Plus a dollar or a euro. So Janine, we just talked about cars. Um, I am going to, I'm, I'm going to ask you about this. Um, you know, the auto industry, it's like not news to anybody here. Trillions of dollars of investment from public and private sectors plus the public. How do you think the auto industry should be investing in micromobility now? They, they have tried. A few of them have tried and mm -hmm. not so successful. Like, yeah. But, uh, I, I think what, is missing is a lot of them have tried to do it themselves versus partner with great organizations <laughs> doing better than they could. Huh, interesting. Uh, so tapping into obviously like the manufacturing capabilities and and the dollars that are behind the auto industry using the tools that they have and then the companies who really know what they're doing in the micro mobility space and building better partnerships between the two. Um, we do have a, a big supplier, automotive tier one supplier, um, Bosch, that works with Trek a little bit when it comes to their batteries. Um, and then they do some testing in our Detroit Smart Parking Lab, which is primarily auto focused, but they kind of etched their way in to showcase all these different use cases for micro mobility and that's the test lab. Um, and that test lab also unlocks to grant dollars as well. Uh, so that's one route we see. Uh, we also, through that Council of Future on Future Mobility and Electrification, um, have brought together um, different startups and then different both suppliers and automakers to talk through um, what are what are the barriers to entry? How do we get these conversations started? Because a lot of times you'll try to start a conversation with an OEM and you just get lost through the mix. They're massive organizations and, and they don't necessarily, they're not as, as friendly as they maybe should be when it comes to investing in some of these smaller startups. Um, so how do we map out that for people to make it as easy as possible so that we have you know, this kind of one page of resource, um, roadmap, whatever you want to call it. Here's where to go to for what um, and at what stage and at what point you go to these OEMs with, with an idea. Yeah, that's really cool. I haven't actually heard of that before. I've heard of it in the context of government. 
and mapping out all the different city departments that you might need to go to, but have not heard about it in the context of an auto OEM. Um, are they all organized similarly? No. Okay. No. I was going to say, this must be like an ever-changing puzzle, right? And then you've got, yeah, every quarter reshuffle. Yeah. It's Monday. Yeah. So, so one project is specific. So council, one of our reasons is actually Alice Whitey. Really was the the co-founder of Bay Mobility, and she uh, obviously has been. She previous to that was with General Motors, so she's seen it from the inside of General Motors, and then she's seen it from the outside, seeking investment um, in a, a startup setting. So she's seen both views, and it's really helping us to navigate um, not only who to talk to and what on the UGM side, but then what the challenges are, and really rally uh, rally the industry together to, to make it just a little bit easier on everyone. Because if, if you get lost in this this mess, um, then you get frustrated and you wonder why you're trying in the first place. Yep, very interesting. Um, so, Frederick, in Europe, the shared versus owned micromobility market looks a little different. Um, you have a robust market for shared micromobility, right? So uh, how do you think investment should be split between shared and owned micromobility or any other categories? Well, I think um, in Europe, it depends pretty much on the different cities and states, how far, how brave the politicians have been right? yeah. making dramatic decisions. Uh, from a, you know, if you, my personal opinion is, is I think that, honestly, shared mobility, mm -hmm. for shared mobility, I don't really believe any of us. Oh, controversial. And <laughs> so we read really, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. I think that first of all, business models help themselves in this way of doing. Mm -hmm. You also think it, most of it is a temporary solution. Uh, I do believe, however, that, you know, share micromobility as a public transport, as means of public transport, makes a lot of sense. So if uh, if we can make the governments and the cities to actually take over the responsibility, that's when it works. Interesting. So summarizing that a little bit, shared micromobility should be considered public transit should be publicly funded or publicly subsidized or whatever you want to call it and maybe regulated in a slightly different way. Yes. Okay. I like that. I like that um, little uh, spicy nugget there. And Janine, um, I want to go back to you though, when we like round on this third uh, topic about areas of investment. Um, what else do you think the public sector should be doing to indirectly invest in micromobility? Like what are this? You're at the state, which is not a, a normal level of policymaking when we think about micromobility. Normally, at the city stage in the past, we would have had like a bunch of municipal policymakers. We might have had some transit agencies who are operating their own bike share systems. But at the state level, we haven't really seen that much engagement, and that's probably to our detriment. So, if you're thinking about you know not just shelling out money for a micromobility grant program, but ways in which the state specifically can indirectly support micromobility, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, so we, we actually bring together different leads in mobility spaces in the cities represented across our state. Um, th there are, at this time, uh, three main cities that are represented. As you go north in Michigan, it becomes more and more rural. Um, they don't necessarily have the funding to support a mobility office in that area, but Ann Arbor, uh, Grand Rapids, and Detroit all do. So we we meet with them monthly on different projects and how we can help support so that we have that ongoing conversation. We're not waiting for them to need something. We're, we're proactively having these conversations and planning together so that we can work across those different organizations. Um, and then on top of that, we also bring in our Department of Transportation, um, the public transportation side of, of MDOT, um, as well as our regional transit authority and, and how do we connect those. If, if we're going to see it as public transit, then the, how do we make sure that um, the user's journey makes sense? How do we make sure that they're all connected together? Um, and I do think the more that we are working together across that state on both the municipal level and the state level, the better we can see where those challenges lie and the better we can uh, proactively create or recommend policies to policymakers. Uh, to remedy those stresses. Interesting, but you're not necessarily looking at uh, policies at the state level that might, for example, work with the DMV to charge 
heavier vehicles more for registration, things like that? We we are. Um, that's all through the Council on Future Mobility. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say you know, policy is a very small portion of my specific role, um, but our organization is kind of 50-50 on the programming and policy side. Uh, so when the policy comes in, like I mentioned earlier, it's it's very heavy, heavily auto-focused, our, our Council on Future Mobility. So we have brought in, um, because those are governor-appointed positions, we can't easily swap people in and out. Um, it, it, it takes a very long process that honestly takes over a year to even swap a single person out. So what we can do is bring in different advisors representing different areas of the industry. So rather than replacing a governor appointed position, uh, we bring in different advisors or different experts in the, the micro mobility space to help us recognize those different areas that we might not see if we're only looking at an auto lens. Interesting. So what I'm hearing is that there's still room for improvement on state policy and certainly across coordination between you know, what your um, departments have procurement um, responsibility for versus what you can do from a policy perspective uh, versus what you can do from an investment and grant making perspective. Um, so, um, Frederick, I want to ask you, like, on this, you know, topic of areas for investment, I mentioned uh, as we were welcoming people on stage that we have 1900 mobility, micro mobility companies right now. Where do you think we need more micromobility companies? Are there certain areas uh, you could answer geographically, you can answer sector wise, where you think it makes sense to uh, put investment dollars? Uh, this might sound very controversial, but uh, hydrogen. Oh. Why? Because uh, right now we have a lot of issues, I think, in the electrification in the cities. And typically, I mean, obviously, the trend is that we want to get rid of the cars in the cities. We want to replace the cars by community. And these micro-mobility solutions need electrification. They need a source of power. And I used to think that hydrogen was mostly the side of the urban areas. But I've seen more and more startups actually focusing on hydrogen solutions. Kinds of... Really? Okay. And I think that... This could be a way for us to also to become less dependent on the large battery suppliers in the world. That's very interesting. I have not actually heard this hot take about hydrogen being a source for micromobility. Um, the grant that I run is focused a lot on clean hydrogen in the U.S. and and actually exporting clean hydrogen to Europe too. But the volumes we're looking at are you know for things like steel facilities rather than for micromobility startups. So I'm very curious whether there's just a different trend of innovation happening in Europe and maybe elsewhere in the world that we're just not yet seeing in, in the U.S. So um, Sean, I'm going to ask you this question. Then I have a final question that I want you to all answer, which is. Um, how do you think investors should be thinking about uh, investing in hardware versus software right now? Or things like new vehicles versus the reuse or uh, resale market? Yeah, so so obviously I would, I'd be very bullish that hardware is important. Now that doesn't mean invest in everybody who has an idea because building hardware takes the right team, the right process. It is expensive. All of the reasons investors say no are, are real. But that being said, we... If we're going to displace cars, we're going to displace them with a physical asset, right? So there's no talking around that. So we need to determine what those are, and we need to innovate on them. Um, I also think it's not going to be just a bike. It's not a scooter. Again, to a marketing problem where everybody thinks we're the industry is scooters. Um, I live in a world where my three kids will not own a single occupancy car, whether it's gas or hydrogen. But... A scooter and a bike isn't going to be their mode at that point either. So if you look around here at the other new vehicles that are being produced and like really coming to market, that's where the investment should be made. So that we're innovating on things that are vehicle replacements for a very changing. Interesting. And not just for, you know, households with two cars where it's a second car replacement, but just wholesale, just like let's create a new generation of riders only. And then to your point about like the used market, if we're going to follow the car industry, right, they, we get the roadmap ready. There's a great secondhand market, right? People make more money on used cars than there's a service component to it. So the, the business models um, are out there. We can easily improve and duplicate young and they're investable. Yep. So I think if you if you look at that holistically, there's still tons of room for investment where hardware is, is a core element of it. Great. Awesome. Okay. So... Uh, final question is like a 
you know, couple word answer. Um, and that is if you were to invite an investor, either a company or an individual to be on this panel with you next year, who would you invite? Who should be here? Janine, you look like you're really contemplating. So I'm going to start with Sean and then go to you. So I think, uh, let's just think of the U.S. government. I think they should be one of the largest investors in what we're trying to accomplish in this room. So I hate to say this word out loud, but I'd say politicians uh, who would actually understand what the sector is, what the business models are. So when you unpack that IRA bill and you look at where dollars go, it's not transforming what we're doing. It's great. There's there's some pieces in there, so let's not look a gift horse in the mouth, but it's disproportionately in favor of um your your home states yeah yeah so president sure. biden or vp harris be great yeah yeah to okay yeah <laughs> yeah probably not good frederick what do you think i was about to to mention some vcs i know that sort of compatible with what we do okay but, um no actually right i'll take a step on because to you all to the EIC unit, to the European Investment Bank, invite them in and say, hey guys, you can invest in this center. from <laughs> oh, it's not high tech. It doesn't need uh, tens of millions of euros as a GC investment just to get going. Amazing. Okay. Maybe an odd answer by Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Okay. Or Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Yeah. Well, then we've given you two homework items, which is to, <laughs> to launch a micromobility grant and to try to get Governor Whitmer uh, here next year. That would be fantastic. So um, everybody, please join me in uh, giving this wonderful panel a round of applause.